All right, so uh, we're going to talk about Psalms. Uh, going to take a break from from David and on the more the historical side to more of um, what he was doing with the Psalms, since he's the major uh, author of the Psalms. So, but let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for your Word. We thank you, Lord, for the Psalms. They are so rich in what you want to tell us and for how to live and just the praise and a thanksgiving and uh, we just thank you lord for that just help us to open up our heart to the holy spirit and what he wants to speak to us today and then we pray amen so the book of psalms is a book of prayers and hymns meant to draw our attention from ourselves which is sometimes pretty hard <laughs> to our to our God. Uh, the Psalms is really made up of a, a hymn book for the Jews, um, a song of praise. And we, we've heard about that in various ways the last, uh, since January, with, with Ian and his sermons on um, Psalms in, in the morning. Uh, but it's the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Why do you think that is? Just some trivia. I don't know this for a fact, but why do you think the book of Psalms is quoted more in the New Testament than any other book? Worship of God, exactly. Practically, not that that's not practical. Which is the biggest book in the Bible? Psalms. So there's a lot of stuff to pull from, a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, among David is Asaph, the sons of Korah, and Solomon are the major writers of the Psalms. And with at least 73 Psalms attributed to David, it, he is the most prolific of all the writers of, of the book of Psalms. So, like I said, we're going to switch gears from studying the historical Bible books that cover the life of David and look at this type of writing involving David, the poetic book of Psalms. So we're going to cover three different things, uh, the psalms of praise, psalms of thanksgiving, and the psalm of lament. Praise, thanksgiving, and lament. So let's go to the very last one, 150, Psalm 150. And... Uh, Let's read it. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing symbols. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So what's the theme of Psalms 150? Praise, exactly. Uh, did you notice anything about the structure of each individual verse? Each verse, there's a little theme. Not, not theme, but a little structure. Each verse has two parts. Uh, like Verse 3, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with the lute and harp. And there's, there's two parts to each one of these, these verses. Uh, Hebrew poetry, as this is referred to, is often marked by parallelism. Couplets or triplets meant to reinforce or contrast an idea. So in this sense, it's, um, it, it's complementing each other. Like verse 2, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness. It, it goes with each other. So, uh, in verse 1, in which places is God to be praised? Sanctuary and, and in the heavens. These two things make the couplet of this verse. Um, so, in some cases the ideas are meant to reinforce one another, and in other cases they are meant to contrast. It d this depends on what the author is wanting to do. Um, but we'll, we'll see this here in a little, little bit. Uh, how are these phrases meant to be understood, you think? 
particularly in, in verse 1. So why the sanctuary and why the heavens, you think? What was he trying to tell us? Pardon? Oh, okay. Heavens is his domain. That's one of the places that he wants us to worship him. Anything else? Well, since the sanctuary is on earth, it is likely pointing to the idea that God should be praised in heaven and earth, a contrasting couplet. All right? In verses 3 and 4, what do the couplets describe? Praise him with trumpet sound and praise him with lute and lyre. What are these descriptions of? Okay, they were instruments. They were instruments to, to be used, all different types of instruments and dance. Uh, these are all examples of how we can express worship to God. Uh, who was the author of the psalm? Anybody? Any Bible tell us? Who's the author of this particular psalm? Well, we don't know. My point is we don't know. Um, it doesn't tell us. This one does not indicate the author. It could be David. It could be, could be someone else. My point is that not every psalm is, we, will tell us who the author is. All right. So the, the psalms are meant to be sung along with various instruments and on various occasions. The song of Psalm 150 is at the conclusion of what's called the Psalter, which is another term for the Psalms. Uh, provides, it, this provides a wonderful way to offer praise to God in various ways, singing, dancing, playing music, etc., for his wonderful works. Is there any way that is an unacceptable way to please God? Growing up, dancing was not allowed <laughs> in, in the church that I grew up. Not just dancing in the church, but dancing outside <laughs> of, of the church. Have you ever thought about that? Is there any unacceptable way to, to praise God? What's that, Pat? Right. Well, I, th I think Jordan, he, he, he talks really softly. <laughs> Some, no, 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 that's, that's cool. He said something that gets the emphasis of God and on yourself, right? Yeah, it's definitely a, a hard issue. When you're praising, it's part of our emotion. Whenever we think about praising God, we think of an emotional event, which is it, which it is. But is the praise being directed all to God, or are we kind of getting some praise ourselves? So just th think about that. Uh, it all has to be totally... For, for God and, and for his, his glory. Uh, no, go, go ahead. Exactly, the Pharisees' prayers. They were very uh, inward focused. They were looking, hey, look at us. Look how spiritual we are. We're saying these flowery prayers, and that's not at all what the Lord wants. He wants the prayers to come from the heart, not to be seen or heard of, from from men. Okay, so that's the psalm of praise. Now we're going to talk about the psalm of thanksgiving. Let's turn to Psalm 136. So if you notice here, when you get there, this is kind of a long psalm, but I want to take some time here and do something that might be kind of unorthodox. But if you notice, at the end of each verse, it's stating the same thing. The repeated refrain is, his steadfast love endures forever, may have been spoken by the people in repetitive, I'm sorry, not repetitive, but responsive worship. So we really don't do that. That's more liturgical, um, as I would call it. We don't do that in the Christian circles as far as the, the Christian churches, but um, there are some denominations that it's responsive reading. So um, what I want to do is I want to read this psalm, 
And I want to read the first part, and I want you guys to read the, the second part in, in unison, just to get a feel for what it was back in the day that this was written. This was very common for them to do this sometimes. So let's read this together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To, who, to him who alone does one great wonders. To him who by understanding made the heavens for his stead... Oops, sorry. <laughs> To him who spreads out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule over the day. The moon and stars to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two and made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him that led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings for, yeah, killed mighty kings. Shihon, king of the Amorites. and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage. A heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's something that we don't do very often. It's not in our normal repertoire of, of service and when we come together. But his loving kindness endures forever. I think that's the main thing he wanted us to know from this psalm. No matter what, His loving kindness endures forever. So uh, we've already answered this first question. What attribute of God is being praised here? His steadfast love. And um, what is the general theme of, of of these verses, you think? What did you get out of it? Okay. The greatness above all. He is so great. Yeah, there, there is no wrong answer here. Um, all right. So how does the psalm open and close? What phrase? Thanksgiving, exactly. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, and oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Um, so there is no absolute guidelines on how to characterize the various psalms, but they can be broadly characterized as fairly obvious categories, and this particular one falls into the, the uh, category of thanksgiving. Um, I don't want to ask you to answer this question out loud, but are you someone that gives thanks, or are you one that doesn't really th- thanksgiving overall? Are, we, are you a thankful people? Not just for what you have, um, but for what is God has done, but 
Ever think about that? Like, how thankful am I? In, in this sense, we're, we're talking about the, the Lord. But um, by having a, I, a persona, not persona, but a, an attitude of thanksgiving, what does that do? When, whenever we are a thankful people, what does that do? Here again, there's no wrong answer, but you're supposed to read my mind on what I'm trying to say. <laughs> brings joy. Thanksgiving brings joy. What else does Thanksgiving do? Encourages others. Encourages others, exactly. All right? You're getting closer to the what I'm, I'm thinking here. What else does Thanksgiving do? Uh, pardon? Humbles. Very good. Very good. Well, the harder times are easier by just getting, just thinking of something else. These are all, all good. Appreciation, exactly. Anything else come to mind when we think of Thanksgiving? Brings glory to God. Brings glory to God, exactly. And what does all this do? There's a particular thing that, going along with what Jordan was saying, what I'm thinking of, it gets our mind off of ourselves. How many times are we so selfish and the things of the world happen and we react a certain way, but being humble and um, having a spirit of thanksgiving just takes, it makes us not think of ourselves and think and put our emphasis on God and what he wants to work through us in our lives. So I would encourage all of you, us, we, to have a, uh, an attitude of thanksgiving constantly um, because it, he, he deserves our praise and he deserves thankfulness for, for what he has, has given us. So anything else you want to add to that? Okay, so uh, the third one is Psalms of Lament. And uh, we're going to go to Psalm 43 on this one. Songs of praise, songs of thanksgiving, psalms of lament. Psalm 43. All right, someone want to read Psalm 43? Thank you. So what is the general emotional state of the psalmist who wrote this, you think? Emotional state? Emotional state. He's in agony. He's in agony. Distraught is the word that's on the, the answer sheet here. <laughs> that agony, distraught. He's in despair. There's just, life isn't going all that great for him. And he's lamenting and uh, uh, just bearing his soul to the Lord. Um, what types of questions is he asking here? Overall. And here again, there's really no wrong answer. Go ahead. Why are you, you rejecting me? Why are you so far away? There's distance between us. Well, I don't feel the closeness. That, uh, that we used to, to, to feel. Um, whose fault do you think that is? The writer of the Psalms or God's? The writer's. God never moves away from us. We always move away from God. So he wants to be there with us all the time, but in our, in our attitudes and in our, our actions, we, we're, we're the ones that move away from God. Uh, did the psalmist ever accuse God of doing wrong in this psalm? No, he did not. He, he knew better to, to do that. 
<laughs> you just wanted to say, God, blah, this is how I'm feeling. Um, no, he simply asked questions about his situation. Um, so in verse 5, there, there's a shift. What shift do you see taking place in verse 5? Yes, of the hope. Yeah. So one through four, first part of five, blah. And then all of a sudden, but hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Do you think God was upset with this psalmist or the, the writer of this psalm for saying what he, he did? Was he disrespectful in any way? No. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right, Josh. Um, the, the, the writer was very respectful, and um, he was doing what God wants us, us to, to do, cast our care on him, you know. Um, do you think God... Uh, laments, I guess, not if that's a word, good, good word or not, when we question God. I don't, he, he isn't really, well, in, in a sense, he is kind of questioning God here, in a broad sense in this psalm. Do you think God likes that, dislikes it, neutral about it? When we ask God questions? Uh-huh. There you go. He's doing it in the right way, and he's seeking God. God is not upset with us when we are angry with him. There's certain some certain circumstances when God, when people in the Bible are angry with God, God doesn't strike them dead. God knows their, their emotions that they're feeling, but they're working through them as long, like Jordan was saying, as we're respectful, knowing that, Hey, I know you're God. I know that some, whatever the, the reason why this is happening, we don't know. We still know you're sovereign. We still know you're in control. But why? Do you think we'll ever know the questions, the answers to some of our questions? Probably not. At least here on earth. I wonder, and this is a question I, I think about too, if we will know why a certain circumstance happened in our life when we get to heaven. That's true. <laughs> that, that's a good point, Cheryl. Right. It's okay. That's exactly right. Jordan, did you have something? Oh, I thought you said something. Nope. You're not going to care. Exactly. We're, we're going to be there, and that's water under the bridge, and for whatever reason, it's for God's glory in any way. You know, the, the verse in the New Testament, all things work together for good, and to them that love the, the Lord, even the good things and the bad things, um, they're all for God's glory. And the Psalms, the, the Psalms of lament, um, it, just, it just brings us closer to God by ans asking these questions out loud. You know, it just helps us work it through the, the situation, hopefully. But then knowing that God is still in control, that's, that's, that's awesome. So the psalmist knows who God is and knows that he can trust in God. But the trial is still difficult. And uh, we're sure that we can all empathize with this feeling. Um, but we need to let the truth about God drive our actions rather than being dragged around by our feelings. We need to let the truth of, about God drive our actions rather than being dragged around by our feelings. How often does that happen? <laughs> we let our feelings run amok so much. God gave us these feelings, but we need to keep them in control and, uh, and understand how to use them properly. Um, this is maybe kind of a stretch, but I'll ask the question to see what you think. Then. What other biblical person that has been talked about in all of our lives, not just in here, um, demonstrated this attitude of l lamenting and um, not really understanding what's going on. Who's the 
quintessential person in the Bible that questioned God's? Job, Karen, yes. Job, if anybody would question God, it would be Job to allow Satan to buffet him like he, he did. But uh, Job questioned, and I don't think he never doubted God, but he just didn't really understand why he was going through what he was going through. So, um, so in, I'll, I'll read this. This is a, a good paragraph. In this type of psalm, the psalm of lament, we find a truly emotional response to circumstances followed by a turning to and a trust in God. Many of the psalms are very helpful for us in times of distress. Turning to what we know about God and hoping in those truths revealed to us in Scripture. While we should be careful not to blame God or accuse Him of wrongdoing, we can express our confusion to Him and ask Him for justice and strength to endure the trial He has brought to us. He is faithful to answer that type of prayer. Amen? Amen. Gage, you want to put up that? There was... Uh, this PDF, and uh, for a smaller group, we would hand this out, and you would get into groups and go through particular psalms and uh, answer these questions. Can you blow that up at all? I didn't know that would be that small. Maybe not. But the, the idea is, and I, I want to go through a couple of these. Uh, we'll just pick any psalm, and um, I didn't print that out. What's that first one? There, we want to see how it's uh, laid out. Who's the author? Um, I can't see that. Jeez. <laughs> author, instructions, occasion, parallelism, and theme. Okay. Um, Mike, pick a psalm, just any psalm, a, a, a short one. Did you have your Bible with you? No. Put you on the spot. Just pick a number. Okay, Psalm 12. Cool, that's a short one. Let's all turn to, to, to Psalm 12. <coughs> Read that silently, and we'll go through a few of these. Not really questions, but Psalm 12. Okay, so who's the author? David, that was, that was easy, it said on top there. Um, any instructions, or uh, what's the occasion of the, uh, of here again, there's not gonna be any wrong answers here. What did you get? Thank you. <laughs> uh, what did you gather from this psalm? Okay, yep, he was, he didn't know what, what, what was going on, why this, that, any other. Okay, someone's turned against him, yep. So, I don't know if there's really any parallelism. This, this psalm particularly does not really have any, many parallels. Um, it kind of just, just flows. Um, any particular theme, you think? Any 
any theme that uh, jumps out at you. Okay. Okay, justice, keep, keep us safe. Good. All right. Who should I pick on next? <laughs> Just to pick a number. Uh, Pat, pick a number. Yeah, pick a psalm. It doesn't really matter. Four, 14, okay. 14 is another short one, cool. Let's read 14 and see what we can come up with that. All right, so who's the author? David again. And uh, do you have in your Bibles a heading above verse, or verse, uh, chapter 14? Does it say something about what the chapter's about? Does anybody have that? What does it say? Okay, there is no one that does good. Uh, anybody else have anything? There, there you go, that's what mine says. The fool says there is no God. All right, so what was the, the general gist of it? What was David saying here? Yes, okay, wickedness of people, the corruption that comes from different people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can, we can relate to that, that's for sure. But then he, he ends the psalm uh, on, on a positive note. Oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. So there's something that happened in David's life that he just says, why, God? The, the, the fools, they just don't know. And... Um, Verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven and the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. Sometimes he has to look kind of hard. <laughs> but. It, yeah. <laughs> True. Sometimes it takes us longer than others. All right, to, to finish up here, uh, read this, that amazingly many of the Psalms even point us to Jesus. Some are clearly messianic, such as Psalm 22, which was quoted by, in part by Christ as he hung on the cross. Others tell us of the pardoning of our sin, like Psalm 51, and should remind us that our sins are forgiven through Christ's work on the cross. Regardless of where we are in a trial or a time or in a time of ease we can look to the psalms to remind us of who God is and what he has done for us meditating on our praying through the psalms would offer a meaningful time of worship whether on your own together or with your family so anything else you want to add about the psalms or what we talked about psalms of lament psalms of praise 
psalms of thanksgiving. Those are three broad categories. Not every psalm fits into those three categories, but those categories usually fit a lot of the psalms. Anything else? I get out a little early, so let's open, or not open, but close in prayer. <laughs> Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the words of David and all these authors. Um, they had a lot of life experience, and that's why they were able to write these, because they experienced life, and uh, they didn't understand a lot of things you did sometimes, but they knew who you were. You knew They knew who this, that you are sovereign, and we thank you, Lord, for that, just Help us as we go our, our separate ways that uh, the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us in all that we do. In the name of we pray. Amen.